His father's associates brought him in to run the Coca-Cola company. He created something of a, of a cult of Coke being more than the sum of its parts, if you will. Uh, uh, so he, he helped continue the, uh, the drive to make Coca-Cola's logo and its presence part of the American social landscape. So I think it was just natural for him to think that the secret formula was a hallowed uh, icon. Uh, and then as a purely historical matter, uh, he came to the company in 1923 uh, at a time in which uh, Coke had had to uh, borrow a lot of money from the banks in New York to pay for overpriced sugar after World War I. And the collateral for the debt was a written copy of the secret formula of Coke dating from 1919. And uh, uh, Woodruff was around when the, Coke, uh, when the uh, sugar debts were paid off. And he went to New York to get the uh, secret formula back. And I, as far as I know, it's in an envelope sealed with sealing wax. And uh, he accompanied it by train back to Atlanta, Georgia, and had it placed in a vault in his father's bank, um, as if to say, I'm, I'm bringing it home. And it has sat there ever since, as far as I know. And uh, the company certainly, through Mr. Woodruff, uh, made the secrecy of the formula you know, one of the biggest business icons in the, in the country. I think Woodruff had an appreciation for Coke's ability to go beyond national boundaries pretty early on, and I think it came not so much in a cultural uh, setting uh, as, as it was climate. He was traveling, this is a famous story, he was traveling across Canada by rail in the 30s, and he was found himself in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan in the dead of winter, about 35 degrees below zero outside. And inside the train station, he saw people drinking Coca-Cola, and he had the thought that you probably get as thirsty in an in a overheated room in winter as you might outdoors in summer. And he commissioned a, a lot of different tests that found that there really weren't any natural uh, climatological or cultural boundaries to Coke.